Thank you, Seth. You've kind of got me fuddled. I'm racking my brain to figure out where I put my stuffed lion. <laughs> we are in Mark chapter 15. We're going to look at verses 1 through 15. Jesus has been through the Jewish trial, and now he faces the Gentile trial. Early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders and scribes and the whole council immediately held a consultation. And binding Jesus, they led him away and delivered him to Pilate. Pilate questioned him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, It is as you say. The chief priests began to accuse him harshly. Then Pilate questioned him again, saying, do you not answer? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer, so Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast, he used to release for them any one prisoner whom they requested. The man named Barabbas had been imprisoned with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the insurrection. The crowd went up and began asking him to do as he had been accustomed to do for them. Pilate answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he was aware that the chief priest had handed him over because of envy. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to ask him to release Barabbas for them instead. Answering again, Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with him whom you call the king of the Jews? I shouted back, crucify him. But Pilate said to them, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. Wishing to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas for them. And having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless our time in it together. Let's bow in a word of prayer. The Old Testament is filled with what we call types, what the book of Hebrews referred to as shadows. We can define a type very simply as a prophetic picture. It's a person or thing or event that corresponds with a future person or event. One of the great prophetic pictures of the Old Testament is the Day of Atonement and the animals that were offered up as sacrifices for the sins of the nation. They were offered in place of the people. They were offered as substitutes. It was an annual event. On that day, the high priest would slay a goat on the altar and then enter the Holy of Holies where he sprinkled the blood of that animal on the mercy seat of the ark for the people's forgiveness. Then he would place his hands on the head of a second goat called the scapegoat, confess the sins of the nation, and in so doing, in effect, place the sins of the people on that goat and then release it into the wilderness where it would carry away all those sins. All of that corresponds to the death of our Lord. That's what all of that looked forward to, was a picture of. Peter called our Lord a lamb, unblemished and spotless. Then described his death as being for sins, the just for the unjust. That's substitution. He died for us. The notion of substitution of one person taking the place of another to save him or her from pain is always considered noble. In Auschwitz, a Polish priest named Maximilian Kolbe volunteered to take the place of a man who was selected for execution when that man cried out, my wife, my children. And so he died in that man's place. 
It was noble and unusual. But what Christ did is more than that. What Christ did is unique. It was not the unjust for the unjust. It was not the sinner for the sinner, but the just for the unjust, the worthy for the unworthy. A German theologian, Jakob Jeremias, put it this way, Jesus died without sin in substitution for our sins. That is the central message of Christianity. We will never understand who Jesus is and what he did. We will never, never understand the Christian faith until we understand substitution. That he took our place in judgment on the cross. John Calvin called it the wonderful exchange. But to make it, he had to be spotless. He had to be sinless. He could not have removed our sins unless he were the spotless Lamb of God. Well, those two truths, that Christ was sinless and that he was a substitute, the just for the unjust, are seen in our passage, Mark chapter 15, verses 1 through 15, when his trial before Pilate proved that he was innocent, and then he died in the place of a notorious criminal. And so we might even say that the New Testament has some types in it. Certainly, Barabbas is a picture of all of us. Now, when we come to our text, the great court of the Sanhedrin had sentenced Jesus to death for blasphemy because he affirmed that he is the Son of God. But that was a religious trial. In order to have the penalty of death carried out, they needed a conviction in a Roman court. That's where Mark 15 occurs. Mark wrote that the chief priests, along with the whole court, bound Jesus and delivered him to Pilate, where they brought the charge, not of blasphemy, but treason. Now that was necessary. Pontius Pilate would not have taken a trial for blasphemy. He was no friend of the Jews or their religion and was not inclined to cooperate with them. More than once he had provoked the population. Once when the Jews rioted, his troops slaughtered a number of them. Luke recounts an incident where he mixed the blood of Galileans with their sacrifices. Pilate rose to power through the military and had a powerful patron in Rome, Lucius Sejanus, commander of the Praetorian Guard. As long as he was in power, Pilate had nothing to fear. But Sejanus had recently fallen. He'd been implicated in a plot against Caesar and executed. Now everyone connected with him was under suspicion. And this gave the Jews some leverage over the governor. They knew the situation and knew that Pilate could not afford to be seen by Caesar as being tolerant of sedition. So they brought Jesus before him on grounds of treason. And Pilate took up the case. Jesus, they said, claimed to be a king, a rival of Tiberius. The procedure in a Roman trial was for the judge to hear the charges, then question the defendant, listen to his responses, and then deliberate with his advisors on the verdict. And so having heard the charge, Pilate asked Jesus if it were true. Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, yes, it is as you say. He wasn't a king in the sense that he was charged with being. He was no political threat to Caesar. And the nature of his kingship is stated more fully in John's account. His kingdom is not of this world, he explained. If it were, his servants would be fighting for him. They weren't. And when they tried to fight for him in the garden, he put a stop to that. But when the priests heard him acknowledge that he was a king, 
they pressed their case against him. Mark wrote that they began to accuse him harshly. But the Lord didn't answer them. He stood there in silence. Well, that didn't help his case, at least not in the mind of Pilate. If, if he didn't answer any of the charges, Pilate would be bound to convict him. So he asked Jesus, do you not answer? See how many charges they bring against you. But the Lord had given his answer. He was a king. But he knew this trial was not about truth and justice. He knew the direction it was going. More importantly, he knew that his hour had come. It was the reason he had come into this world. He had allowed himself to be arrested. He would allow himself to be convicted. So he didn't answer, which was a fulfillment of prophecy. Isaiah 53, verse 7, Like a sheep that is silent before its shearer, so he did not open his mouth. Pilate had never seen anything like this, and Mark says that he was amazed. He knew that Jesus was innocent. And he wanted to have him released, but he didn't have the courage to acquit him and dismiss the case. The priests had the upper hand. So instead, he tried to outmaneuver them. The Roman governors, according to Roman law, could obey a custom which Pilate applied during the Passover that he would release one prisoner that the people wanted freed. The crowd had already gathered for this purpose when Pilate gave them the choice. He would release to them Jesus or Barabbas. Barabbas is a curious character, largely because we know nothing about him other than what we find in the Gospels. His name suddenly appears in the accounts and then disappears after the incident. Legends have grown up about him, but the only reliable information we have is what is recorded in the Gospels. And yet from them, we can piece together a likely portrait. His name is Bar Abba, which means son of Abba, son of the father. And it was a common surname uh, among rabbinic families. So it may be that Barabbas was the son of a rabbi. His full name may have been Jesus Barabbas. There are some manuscripts that have that name connected to him, but they're not very strong. They're not very early manuscripts, and the evidence is not very strong, but that's a possibility. What is known from John and Mark's account is that Barabbas was a robber and a murderer who had been involved in a notorious rebellion. Mark calls it the insurrection. So Barabbas was a revolutionary, probably a, a member of the Zealots who fought guerrilla wars against the Romans. He was well known among the people. In Matthew's account, he's called a notorious prisoner. No doubt he was a hero to some, a super patriot to them. No doubt he was hated by Pilate and the Romans. But Pilate must have known something of the popularity of Jesus. Mark indicates that, that he did in verse 10, where he says that Pilate knew that the priests were envious of him. That's the reason they delivered him over to them. It was out of envy. And so Pilate had sized them up well. He knew they were motivated by jealousy of the Lord's popularity. And he felt confident that the choice he would give between these two men was a safe one. He knew enough about the Jews to know that they would prefer a rabbi to a robber. So when the crowds gathered, Mark writes in verse 9 that Pilate responded to their request for a prisoner by asking, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? Now, at this moment, something happens that Mark doesn't record, but is found in Matthew's account. 
Pilate was interrupted by an urgent message from his wife. It couldn't wait. She evidently had a note passed to him saying, Have nothing to do with that righteous man. For last night I suffered greatly in a dream because of him. Well, maybe it was a supernatural dream. Maybe the Lord gave a message to her through that dream. There are examples of that in the Bible of such dreams given to Gentiles and pagans. Or maybe this shows that Pilate, or at least his wife Procla, was very familiar with Jesus and his ministry. She knew enough about him to know that he is a righteous man. Now that is further testimony in this trial of the Lord's innocence. It's coming from a Gentile. It will come from Pilate as well. That he was the spotless Lamb of God. And knowing about these proceedings, she was afraid that her husband was in danger of making a fatal error in judgment. Well, whatever the origin of the dream, divine revelation or human wisdom, it was providential and it was a last warning given to Pilate. During this time, Mark says, the priests used the delay to their advantage and they worked the crowd. They um, probably were dealing with a crowd that was different from the multitude that uh, we saw earlier in that week that accompanied Jesus over the Mount of Olives and into the city of Jerusalem in what's known as the triumphal entry. They hailed him as king. Well, they were mainly pilgrims from Galilee. So they were Galileans, and these were probably Judeans gathered there that morning. Still, they knew Jesus. They knew him by name, certainly. They knew his reputation. It had filled the land in both Galilee, Samaria, and Judea, and Jerusalem. And they had likely heard him in the temple teaching where he did every day. But the priests likely circulated stories among them that they had fabricated about him. And they were able to turn the crowd so that when Pilate asked again, which prisoner they wanted him to release, they demanded Barabbas. They chose that son of the father over the true son of the father. Pilate was at a loss as to what to do. He could only release one and the other had to be crucified or executed. And so he asked, then what shall I do with him whom you call the king of the Jews? And in verse 13, Mark gives their immediate response. They shouted back, crucify him. Pilate tried to reason with them. He knew Jesus was innocent. This made no sense to him. He said, why? What evil has he done? But they wouldn't listen to reason. I think a psychologist would explain this as mass hysteria and the madness of crowds, but this wasn't that. This is something far more sinister. This was satanic. Still, the people knew what they were doing and cried out even louder, crucify him. In John's account, when Pilate resisted the priest played their strongest hand, they said, if you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. And I can just see as they say that, Pilate in his mind saying Sejanus and knew he could not afford to offend Caesar. Besides that, Matthew said that Pilate saw that a riot was starting. He wanted to free Jesus, but not at the expense of a riot, and certainly not at the expense of his own life. So Matthew wrote that at this time, he took a bowl of water and washed his hands and said, I'm innocent of this man's blood. Again, there's a testimony to the innocence of Christ. There's a testimony to the spotlessness of Christ. Christ. 
But he's the only one that's innocent here. Pilate certainly was not innocent. Pilate was willing to pursue justice, but only up to a point. When it threatened him, then his courage didn't match his convictions. He punted. In the end, he was no different from the priests. They both rejected Christ for expediency. They rejected him to protect their own personal interests. And so Mark writes in verse 15 that Pilate released Barabbas, had Jesus scourged, and handed over to be crucified. It was a miscarriage of justice and a tragedy for Pilate. And there is a warning for all of us in this. Pontius Pilate could never have known when he woke up that morning that he would face this crisis, a crisis that would make him a notorious figure of history and one that would define him as a man. We know the name of Pontius Pilate. Everyone knows the name of Pontius Pilate and it is because of this and in connection with this. And there's a warning for all of us in this. Just as Pilate could not have known what he faced that morning, you and I face similar situations. We can't know what's facing us each day when we wake up. But we can be sure that we can face anything, face any decision that will threaten us personally or financially or call for a hard decision, one that will challenge our convictions, that we can face that if we are properly prepared for it. And there's only one way to be properly prepared for unseen crises like this. Unseen events in our life that call for a critical decision on our part that may cause us to compromise things if we're not careful. And the only way to do that is to be well grounded in God's Word and be walking by the Spirit daily, continually. We can never take a vacation, as it were, from our daily walk with the Lord. We do not know what is coming next. We do not know what the next moment of our life holds. The only way to be prepared for that is to be continually in the Word of God, walking by the Spirit, so that we do decide well, so that we will choose to act in righteousness regardless of the consequences. And again, I say the only way to prepare for that is to be in God's Word and prayer constantly. How easy it is to drift from that to let other things come into our life. That's a danger. Not one of us, not one of us is able to stand against the pressures of the world in our own strength. We can only stand in Him. But there's a bigger picture here than Pilate and challenges that we may face in life. This was a miscarriage of justice, the greatest in history. This in combination with the previous trial before the Sanhedrin. Those are the greatest miscarriages of justice in history, but none of it was a mistake. It was all according to God's purpose. Fifty days later, Peter said that very thing on the day of Pentecost. Godless men put Jesus to death, but he was delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. Acts chapter 2, verse 23. The trial served a purpose. Both the Jewish trial and the Gentile trial, it established the guilt of those involved and the innocence of Christ. Pilate professed it. The Lord's Gentile judge stated his innocence. His death, as Peter described it, was the just for the unjust. He was the innocent, spotless Lamb of God who died in the place of the guilty. He died for the elect 
but the elect were just as guilty as the non-elect. And that was demonstrated or illustrated dramatically in the release of Barabbas, whose place Jesus took on the cross. Jesus went to Calvary, and Barabbas went free. What a a picture that is of us. Barabbas was guilty of sedition. He was a rebel, and each one of us is guilty of rebellion against God. He was a thief, and each one of us is guilty of living for self and stealing God's glory, breathing His air every day without thanking Him for it or acknowledging His goodness and mercy. And we were guilty of murder. Maybe not actually taking another's life. Few people are really guilty of that. Few people commit that crime. But certainly, we are guilty of murder within our hearts through anger and envy and hate. And every one of us is guilty of Christ's death because it was our sin that put him there. But certainly, that is true of us. By nature, we are, as Paul said in Romans chapter 8, verse 7, hostile toward God, at enmity with God, at war with him in our hearts. In fact, if if we had been there that day in that crowd, we too would have been crying out for Barabbas because each one of us by nature is Barabbas. Can you see yourself in that crowd crying out, crucify him? Can you see that? If you can't, you haven't seen the portrait that the Bible uh, paints of you and all of us in our natural condition. If you think I'm being unfair, is John unfair? This is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. It's still true. It's true of every man. That's the crowd that was there that day and that is you and me Naturally, in our natural condition. We love Barabbas rather than Jesus. We are Barabbas. That is what makes salvation so unsearchable and grace so amazing. Because on Good Friday, Jesus changed places with him, with a robber. And more importantly, when he went to the cross, he changed places with us. Calvin called it, that wonderful exchange. Others have called it the great exchange and the sweet exchange. Not only did he exchange places with us, but also a transaction occurred in which he exchanged his righteousness for our sin. And as our substitute was punished for it, he paid the debt that we could not pay the debt that we owed, but we were unable to pay back. He paid it. What's more, in exchange for our sin, every believer in Jesus Christ receives his righteousness so that God considers us to be righteous just as Christ is righteous, just as his son is righteous. It's an imputed righteousness. It's a legal righteousness. It's the declaration of innocence and that we we match the righteousness of the law. That's what Paul says. That's how he explains the cross and what took place in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. In him we are considered by God to be righteous. That that moved Martin Luther to pray, you have taken on yourself what you were not and have given me what I am not. And what I am not, in and of myself, is righteous. The righteousness I now have is an alien righteousness. It's that that which is gifted to me by God. And that's what God does. As Paul wrote in Romans 4, 5, He justifies the ungodly. 
He imputes to the ungodly. He transfers to the ungodly righteousness even though they are sinners. And he can do that because Christ traded places with us. A great exchange happened. He took our sin and gave us his righteousness. He took our death and gave us his life. And all of that becomes ours through faith, not by works, not by our personal effort. He justifies the ungodly, not the self-improved. He saves us where we are in our sins. And he applies all of that at the moment of faith and through faith alone. It's all of grace. Free and sovereign grace. Again, Barabbas gives us a, a picture of that. picture of grace in more than one way. And one way was in the way that grace came to him. Completely unexpectedly, completely undeservedly. When he awoke that morning, he must have awakened with great dread if he was even able to sleep that night. He knew that in a few hours he would be hanging on a cross. When he heard the noise of the crowd outside and heard them shouting Barabbas, he might have thought they were calling for his blood. And with good reason. He was guilty. He knew that. Then the door opened. Roman guards stood there. And he must have thought, well, this is it. His time had come. The guard loosened his chains and said, Go. You're free. Someone else has taken your place. He must have stood there for a moment in stunned silence unable to take it in. Just when he thought the door had opened to his death, he learned that it opened to his freedom, to his life. And we can be sure he walked through the door out into the morning light and to freedom, but we don't know anything else about him. Barabbas disappears from the pages of history. We don't know if he followed the procession up to Calvary or went off in a different direction. We don't even know if he ever gave another thought to the one who had taken his place. There is a legend that he went to Calvary, fell at the foot of the cross and cried, Oh, Jesus of Nazareth, I know not who you are, but this I know, you are hanging there in my place. It's a legend, but it states the truth. Uh, not just for Barabbas, but more significantly for each one of God's people. Christ took our place on the cross. He became our substitute. He died, the just for the unjust. And the grace of God that put Christ on the cross found us in a desperate and doomed condition like a prisoner chained up in a dark dungeon, helpless and hopeless. He found us. We didn't find Him. Before we ever thought of Him, God had us on His heart and in His plan from all eternity. Nothing happens by chance. God caused the light of the gospel to shine in our hearts so that we understood our lost condition and believed in Christ as our Savior. That's the only way anyone is saved. It is all of God. He seeks and He saves. What Barabbas experienced physically, believers in Jesus Christ have experienced spiritually. And because of that great exchange and sweet exchange, we can sing, He breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. That's true of every believer in Jesus Christ. Have you believed in Him? Or are you still like Barabbas, in jail, under sentence of death? 
Are you like that crowd, choosing Barabbas over Christ, preferring something else, some earthly thing, some temporal pleasure, some other path to the promise of life in Jesus Christ? If that's true, you've made the wrong choice. Christ died to set the believer free from the penalty and the power of sin, and only He can do that. Only He can set the prisoner free. If you want freedom, real freedom, that is unto eternal life, then believe in Jesus Christ. He receives all who do. And sets you free. Sets the prisoner free. If you're a believer, you've been set free. Live for Him. As Paul told Timothy, lay hold of your eternal life. Live it. And live it to the full. May God help you to do that. Help all of us to do that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for this disturbing passage, this passage that cannot read without being a bit grieved by it. But what a glorious passage, what it pictures for us, and what our Lord went through and suffered for us. If we want a picture of the love of God, there it is, suffering injustice because He knew that this was the way to the cross and for salvation for us. And He suffered it willingly for us. Lord, make that thought, that truth, take root in our heart and affect us in the way we think and the way we live. May we live to your honor and glory, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.